Good evening and welcome to our Vespers service and first streaming version of that service. Before we get started, I would like to offer a bit of encouragement during this uh, tumultuous time as the crisis continues. I want you to know that uh, God will use this crisis for our good. It may not seem like it, but if you remember the story of Joseph, the 11th son of Jacob, he had a dream about his brothers and parents that they would some, someday bow down to him, and he was foolish enough to share that dream with his 10 older brothers. Their disdain for their youngest brother and, uh, uh, caused them to want to kill him. Uh, but the, one of the brothers stood up, and uh, Reuben, and convinced them not to kill him, but to merely sell him off into slavery, so they did. And he was taken into Egypt, as you recall, to work in the household of Potiphar, whose wife falsely accused him of, of attempted rape, and he was put into prison for several years and forgotten, abandoned. Eventually, he was released because he could be of service to Pharaoh, and he uh, ascended in power to the point where he was the second in command. And when famine hit and his brothers came to ask for food, it was Joseph who, before whom they had to bow in humility. Joseph's dream was fulfilled. After the death of his parents, Joseph's brothers were obviously worried he might seize the moment to extract a little bit of revenge on them. So they went before him and begged for their lives, and Joseph's response was profound. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And that's how God works. He will work that way in our present crisis as well. What the wicked intend for evil, God intends to use for good, the good of his people. What Satan plots for harm of God's people, God intends to turn it around and use it for our growth. It isn't just that there's a silver lining or a bright side to things. It's that the dominating central storyline is all about the redemptive purposes of God in all things. And that storyline is simply obscured from our view at times by the evil and the suffering we witness. Whatever is happening around you, economic downturns, food shortages, ravaging illness, political crisis, whatever it is, you can rest assured that God intends to use it for your good. It's a challenging time, no doubt, but I encourage you to be faithful, to be faithful in prayer, to the one and only God who can do anything about this crisis, to be faithful in virtual worship here as we gather spiritually together, faithful in study of God's word. We have some Bible studies and some, youth, some care groups that are going online. I'm contemplating doing the same, uh, so watch for that. Be faithful in staying connected with the family of grace. Uh, you can text, you can call, you can write a card. How novel is that? Be in touch. Be faithful in your financial support of the ministries here at Grace. Bills still need to be paid. Ministry has work to do. Uh, things still require uh, that your offerings and tithes come into us. So uh, send your checks in, uh, go online, use our Giving Plus app. There'll be more about that coming out soon. Tom Hutzel has prepared a kind of walkthrough on how to use the online giving app. It's also available on your mobile phones. So with that, I just want to simply encourage you that God's got this, and he intends to work everything out for our good, for the people who trust him and love him. 
And to that I say, Amen. Let us begin now with our worship this evening. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. A reading from Psalm 10. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says to his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in the thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand, forget not the afflicted. We continue with the reading selected for today, beginning with Job chapter 24. These are those who rebel against the light, who are not acquainted with its ways, and do not stay in its path. The murderer rises before it is light, that he may kill the poor and needy, and in the night be it, he is like a thief. The eye of the adulterer also waits for the twilight, saying, No eye will see me, and he veils his face. In the dark they dig through houses by day. They shut themselves up. They do not know the light. For deep darkness is morning to all of them, for their friends with the ter terrors of dark, deep darkness. Here ends the reading from Job. The second reading is from 1 John chapter 3. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Here ends the reading from 1 John. Our third reading is from Matthew chapter 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of, pro of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we, had shedding, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves 
that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute them from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of innocent Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barachiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Our reading from the Passion according to St. Mark is from chapter 14. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him, meaning Jesus, by stealth and kill him. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all of the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together, and Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And, he, and some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witness do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! And the guards received him with blows. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord, my God. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Deliver me, O Lord, my God. For you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the fourth in the series of sermons preached on eyes on Jesus. Tonight's title is Murderous Eyes. If looks could kill, can you picture your eyes filled with rage? Yeah, likely you've seen it in the eyes of someone else. But perhaps you've seen it on your own face through an all ill-timed glance in the mirror. In the ancient world and still today, in some cultures, the evil eye is a glance that is thought to cause harm to the recipient. That's how I envision the eyes of the chief priests and the scribes, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, as they plotted Jesus' death and 
tonight's passion reading. They were filled with hatred and murder as they gazed upon Jesus being greeted with praise in Jerusalem during Holy Week. And before that, when face to face with Jesus, they heard him speak woes and repro reproaches to them. If they could have spewed venom or, or shot arrows out of their eyes at the Lord, they would surely have done so. I don't remember what I did to deserve it, but I, I recall my reaction to, to the punishment. My father, he, he had chastised me, shall we say, and sent me to my room. I vividly remember going to my room angry and behind closed doors muttering, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Of course, I didn't do it loudly enough so that he would hear me. I'm sure my eyes had that murderous look the Jews had. But I knew in my heart that I'd gotten what, I was, what was coming to me for my misdeed, whatever it was, I can't recall. <laughs> and I needed to be sorry and change my ways. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, said Jesus. No doubt with a rather stern fatherly look. This rhetoric, it wouldn't fit in with Dale Carnegie's advice, you know, given in the 1936 bestseller, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Of course it wouldn't. But it was what they needed to hear. So those words were spoken in love, just as my father had done in disciplining me. God and his representatives never speak the law to us in malice, but only because we need to recognize our sin and know what to repent of. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, said Jesus, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Kind of painted themselves in a corner there. And he says, fill up then the measure of your fathers. In other words, Continue doing what your fathers did before you. Jesus wanted them to recognize their rank hypocrisy and repent. So he mockingly says, fill up then the measure of your fathers to bring them face to face with the murder that lay in their hearts under their pious pretenses of honoring the murdered prophets, and behind their pious platitudes of, we wouldn't have done what our fathers did. But multi-generational guilt is real when the sons of the fathers lack repentance. So Jesus challenges them to push things forward to their logical conclusion. I know your hearts, I can see the murder in your eyes, Go ahead, walk in the steps of your fathers. Why don't you go ahead and kill me too and continue your family tradition? There's nothing new under the sun, said the preacher in Ecclesiastes. Murderous thoughts and looks are as old as the fall into sin. Cain's downcast eyes became murderous toward his brother. The cause of murder is always the agency of man. But the original source is the devil, who Jesus says was a liar and murderer from the beginning. St. John said that the murderer Cain was of the evil one. Addressing the Jews who wanted to kill him, Jesus identifies Satan as the father of all who hate God's son. But how does that pertain to us? Aren't John and Jesus just wailing on Cain and the murderous Jews? Surely the Lord's not talking to us pious Christians, is he? But listen to his word. 
His apostle, St. John, writes, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And a bit later, if anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Follow the simple logic. If I claim to love God while hating my brother, I am both a murderer and a liar. And therefore cannot love God. And if I don't love him, then I must hate him. Looks like Cain and the hostile Jews and all of us are in the same boat. This is why we make this confession to Jesus in an old hymn from our blue or red hymnal, the, the Lutheran hymnal. It says, I caused thy grief and sighing by evils multiplying, as countless as the sands, I caused the woes unnumbered with which thy soul is cumbered. Thy sorrows raised by wicked hands. Don't lie to yourself. You have said in your heart, I have reasons for hating my parents. I can make excuses for wishing that my brother was dead. I have good cause for casting an evil eye upon my neighbor. That's enough to make you a murderer in God's sight and a place you and to place you under his wrath the Jews filled up the measure of their fathers in tonight's passion reading and if we're honest we ourselves must see we're right there alongside them what a marvel then that the father would allow his son to be murdered at the hands of sinful men just to save a bunch of rotten, rebellious sinners with eyes filled with rage against God and man. Paul tells us in Romans, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. The wrath of God is, is not a murderous glance from the Father, but a look of righteous judgment upon the guilt of sin. We all deserve God's wrath just as much as I deserve my Father's punishment. But instead of giving us what we deserve, God put it on Jesus. And Jesus willingly took it for us men and for our salvation. From the cross, Jesus looked upon the masses of humanity and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Original sin, which produces lies, hatred, murder, and even other sin, is so deep a corruption that we cannot recognize the depravity of what we think, say, and do unless, unless it's revealed by God's word. But once our murderous eyes have looked in horror on what we really have done, nailing the innocent Son of God to the tree with our sins, then we also are ready for the joyful good news of the forgiveness of all our sins for the sake of Jesus Christ's voluntary sacrifice at the hands of murderers, a death by which he has extinguished the wrath of God toward us. Again, Paul says, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled, Shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Rejoicing in the theme 
of Lator, which is Latin for the fourth Sunday in Lent, so rejoice in Christ, who has turned your murderous eyes, my murderous eyes, away from sin, guilt, and despair, and lifting them up to look upon himself as your Savior, Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, took the wrath of his Father so that you might be saved. Thanks be to God. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come to you. Lord Jesus Christ, we often have gazed with murderous hatred upon our fellow man. Look upon us with favor. Forgive all our sins and replace all our hatred in our hearts with love for you and our neighbor. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you despise nothing you have made, and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and contrite hearts that, lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, we may receive from you full pardon and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, who released many from their bondage to sin, death, and the devil, as a healer of the nations. But when it came time to release you, the crowd chose a murderer instead. Through our co-crucifixion with you, of you in the waters of bath, baptism, we may May we continually be released from our sins as we confess you to be our everlasting King. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thank you for joining us this evening. That concludes our service uh, and look forward to our Sunday service uh, this week. Um, just a reminder, uh, as we do when we uh, actually gather together for these services, uh, rather than taking collection during the service, collection is taken up uh, as you leave the sanctuary. So as you uh, complete this uh, bit of the service, please remember to go to our online giving on our website, gracelutherancc.com, and click Donate and Give for the sake of the ministry of Grace Lutheran Church and for the kingdom of God. Amen.